Welcome, everyone, to the Amplifier Podcast. Today, I have my really good friend, Big Joe Clark, uh, as a guest. And I'm excited to talk with Joe because he and I have known each other for about three or four years now, and and he uh, agreed to come on the show and share some of his win- wi- wisdom. You know, his name is Big Joe Clark because he's got such a big Big Joe Clark because he's got such a big heart. And uh, Joe uh, Joe's a, a certified financial planner, and he's been in the financial services industry for 30 years. Joe's the managing partner of the Financial Enhancement Group uh, that manages. Uh, Uh, and manages assets and does financial planning based out of Indiana. His firm manages uh, more than 650 million uh, serving families in 31 states across the United States. Joe's also been a former adjunct uh, assistant professor at Purdue University, having taught the capstone course for the financial counseling and planning programs for seven years. Uh, Joe is also a member of Ed Slot's Master Elite IRA Advisory Group and has appeared on various national and local media outlets. For the past 20 years, Joe has been the host of a radio show, Consider the Program, and writes a weekly column for the Herald Bulletin. Joe's radio program airs on IB, uh, I, WIBC on Saturday mornings at se- uh, 6 to 7 a.m. Uh, and on multiple stations throughout the United States. Uh, Joe has two trademark processes that help reduce financial regrets. Families get confidence and clarity about their financial journey, providing them freedom to use their resources and enjoy their life that they earned. Families get a team of 38 professional collaborators as fiduciaries that help them manage their future um, and their life. Joe wants to share his educational content across America He's created 20 years of radio shows, podcasts, newspaper columns, videos, uh, and is spreading the word about a topic that I know nothing about. He calls it incremental incapacitation. Joe, welcome to the show, buddy. And what the heck is incremental incapacitation? Well, if they didn't fall asleep during the introduction, hopefully I will provide them something to... uh to wake them up with a little bit. Um, you know, I, I'm a, I live in, a, in an odd world. I come from a family of educators. Um, if you're not familiar with Indiana, I know a lot of you are in Canada. Um, Indiana is the middle of the country. Um, we are deemed to be the number one in terms of loyalty. Uh, that would be our character trait that we would have. Uh, and so we tend to follow in our father's footsteps so to speak. And, um, you know, when I, I grew up and I have 29 educators on my mom's side of the family, um, I didn't follow that footpath. Uh, we moved to a farm community in Lafayette, Indiana. Um, many of you may know about pheasant hunting. Um, a lot of people go to South Dakota to do that now. It used to be Benton County, Indiana where people would go to do that. Some still do when they know about it. Just doesn't seem like a place that you would want to travel to. Um, but we have big pheasants and great hunting. And um, I fell in love with farmers. And in 1983 and 84, we lost two big farms. People who had worked for generations to be able to build a, an establishment. and dads died and farms were lost because of the U.S. tax code. Um, And so I went to school to learn to be an estate planning attorney uh, to be able to help defend that. And while I was there, uh, the president at the time, Reagan, uh, took office, changed the tax code. The farms would have been saved. I recognized I had dyslexia. Um, I can't do patterns, which has been very beneficial to me. Um, you wake up every day as an average person or a normal person and knowing what happened yesterday and being able to use it as a pattern today, I have to wake up every morning as a new day. Um, so if you ever show me, show me an Excel spreadsheet done, um, I, I have no idea what it says. Uh, that's why I have the 38 people that are on my team that are all CFAs and chartered market technicians and CPAs and attorneys. Uh, that's, that's not my gig. Um, I have to connect new pokey dots every day. 
And so when I was at Purdue, um, again, proving that God had a sense of humor, uh, I was tasked with teaching the seniors at Purdue in their financial planning program because I was a certified financial planner. And um, I got into the textbook and it was wrong. You know, they wanted me to give these kids and, and you've got to remember, I came from a very modest income, you know, lower middle income family in America when I was in the university. And they gave them this 240 page textbook that cost $240. So I, I always giggled that it was a dollar per page. And there were pages that were wrong. And it's not, the, in this case, the author was wrong. But what typically happens is the tax code changes so quickly and the economy changes so quickly that people make mistakes. And so I, I did what any quick start would do, any entrepreneur would do. I went to Purdue and I said, I wanna get rid of the textbook and I wanna change the curriculum. And they said, well, we really can't do that, but if the CFP board in Denver will say you can, we'll change the curriculum. And so I changed the curriculum and the, and the CFP board said, yeah, that's good. And so being an entrepreneur, I trademarked a process called the family focus process um, where I recognized and, and James Clear, and I, I don't know if James has been on your podcast or not, but um, James Clear wrote Atomic Habits. And one of the things that he pointed out is success is never dependent upon one thing, but failure can be. And what I did was to look at what I call the five critical elements of financial planning and say, okay, you can get four of these right, but if you miss one, you will be destroyed. Everything will be for naught. And it is what I call your life after work. Some people would call it retirement. In my 34 years of being in the industry, I don't see many people just retire, right? The second is the annual tax plan. And I don't care whether you're in Canada, Ireland, Scotland, or the United States, you need to have a tax strategy and it has a calendar year end date. The third is the investment playbook. The economies do change, the world changes. The fourth are the, the one-offs, the things that, um, the, I call them the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, Don, you and I have kids, you know, one of mine's married, one's not. You know, you're gonna, I mean, we're gonna go through things that are good. We're gonna go through things that are not so good. And, you know, the, the, the advantage of me taking care of more than 2000 families for the last four decades is I've been able to build checklists. And if you're a book reader, if you, haven't led, if you haven't read Checklist Manifesto, you should. But the last was the legacy plan. And I'm not an attorney. I don't play one on TV. I don't play one on radio. Um, but I will tell you that all attorneys are not equal in America. And I would presume they're probably not all equal in Canada. And that really- I would agree with that 100%. <clears throat> That is, that is really where the idea of incremental, when, when I find holes in a game plan, you know, I'm an old football player, right? When I find holes in a game plan, that's what I try to exploit. And this time I've switched to the other side of the aisle. This is what I'm trying to protect. And that's where incremental incapacitation comes from. So I've talked a long time why don't you ask me what you think it means? Why don't you try to break it down? What, what do you think incremental incapacitation would mean? Well, in the context of protecting wealth and, you know, living with your wealth um, and uh, having a plan for how it gets passed on, um, if that's what your plan is, whether that's charity, beneficiaries, heirs, whatever, um, I think, you know, the, the incremental incapacitation is one, as you put it, one thing you said there that I agree with so uh, avidly, you said James Clare said that success is never one thing, but failure can be. Um, I've done a lot of work and, and, and with, you know, a, a common friend of ours, Dr. B.J. Fogg, and 
Um, I've become a professional behavior designer, and in his system of understanding how behavior works, you do something called, you know, it's basically sequencing of how you're going to get an outcome. And and his, you know, what most people do is they create a plan and they stick to it and they wait till the end to see if it worked. And you know, in his in his process, he says like that does, you know, you don't want to do that. You don't want to you don't want to take two years or twenty years with one plan to find out at the end that it didn't work. You wanna you wanna play around with the sequences, spot where the gaps are, and test it quickly so that you can come up with the best plan, so that you don't have that one thing in your sequence that's going to be a failure. Now, to me. When I think about all of the things that I've learned through all of our colleagues around estate planning and tax planning and trusts and fiduciaries, well, one thing for me as an entrepreneur is I'm confused as hell. <laughs> and two, I know that any one of those things can, can be uh, a bear trap, whether that is um, incrementally losing control of how you use your money, uh, if you are, you know, you know, a lot of people I know will write a will and they'll assign, you know, their their older brother, their younger brother, their uncle to be the, the trustee of the will. And they think they've got it sorted. And uh, there's no tax planning in there. There's no uh, consideration of, you know, what are the needs of, of different people who may uh, share in whatever it is you're leaving behind. And so, you know, you know, I don't know exactly what you mean, but I know there's so you, five or six elements, and, and any one of them you could fail at. And you did you did so well for knowing nothing about it to explain. Yeah. Um, well, well, and, and I actually have a genuine I have a genuine desired interest to figure that not to figure it out, right? So you and I are both in genius uh, in genius network and in strategic coach. This is not my unique ability, nor do I want it to be. But I do want to have people I trust who can help me through this. And that's what I think my audience needs is not to dive in and think I've got to figure out how to do all this myself because as rugged individuals, entrepreneurs, that's what we try to do with a lot of our things. This is an area where I have zero interest and zero intent to learn it except to lean on someone like you and some of our other colleagues who have mastered this with 30 years and 2,000 families, why should I experiment with that developing those sequences? Because I simply want to have a shortcut that says, Joe, what do I got to do here? <laughs> so, and, and, and Don, it, it, it's so well put. And for your listeners, um, to understand the success that he has had as an individual, and when I say he, I mean Don, and what he's done, and to be able to have that vulnerability is why you're listening to the podcast. And, and I don't say that to be condescending or, or acclimating anyway. I'm just telling you that it's true. And, and so here's, here's what happens with, with any estate planning case that I've been involved with. Um, so again, as I tell people in the United States on my radio, my podcasts, my newspaper columns, I'm not an attorney. I don't play one on TV, radio, or in the newspaper. Uh, I have probably read more estate plans than any other attorney in the country from other attorneys. So, so understand the breakdown there, right? It's, you know, of, of, the, of the 2,000 families that I've taken care of, I've had federal judges, neurologists, surgeons, school teachers, farmers, entrepreneurs, right? And I've had all of their collective trust that I am obligated to read and quote unquote decipher. Um, and so I've got some of the best ideas and some of the best strategies that, that have come from that, even though I don't create the documents. And Don, what happens is when you and Gemma come in to see me, you know, we sit down and you love your children and you love your legacy. And when people think about legacy planning, they always think about what happens when I'm gone, when I die, right? 
And I teach people economically about the three phases of finance. Um, my book, Retirement Runway, will be out next year. And it's, it's about those, you know, the takeoff, the 30,000 feet and the landing. Well, the same is true with your estate plan. You and Gemma are perfectly qualified right now to be able to make decisions. Here's who I want to get this. Here's who I want to get that. Here's how I want them to receive it. There are about 11 to 12 in the United States major decisions that you have to make inside of a trust plan. The rest of it's legal ease, right? So you want the right attorney writing the right code, but you want to get those 11 to 12 decisions right. And that's really what my team coaches people on. But that's why you're able to think about it. And then everybody goes to the next stage. Now we're gone, right? God's called us home. Now, how's it going to happen? How does this transpire? How do we do it the easiest way possible? How do we do it without the least amount of taxes? How do we, how do we make sure that we're not enabling somebody that shouldn't be enabled to gamble, drink? How do we give money? How do we not give money to a special needs child and yet still protect for their interests? And what I try to explain to people in the United States is that 10% of us die. 90% of us fade away. So 10% of us will be hit by a car, will have a heart attack, will have a stroke. 10% of us just drop dead. But 90% of us fade away. And, and you may not like the comedy that comes with this, but it's, you know, I tell people that you become a sandwich short of a picnic. But the problem is it's one bite at a time. And Don, the problem is you and Gemma tend to travel the same path. You're nibbling on the same snack, right? And so, you know, you and I are entrepreneurs. We built companies. We've been, you know, success beyond our beliefs and, 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 and anything we deserve. But, I mean, the challenge is no, your wife nor my wife is going to look at us and go, I think you lost it. You know, why did you invest in this company? Jim is not calling you today and saying, why is Joe on the podcast, right? And she's not going to call and say, why did we invest in Sasha? Or why did we invest in anything that Gordy wanted to do? Or why are we going to Genius Network, right? We've been doing that our whole lives. And nobody asks what's wrong when it looks like it works. Right. And that's really the essence of the problem. It's not that we can't make good decisions if we have good advisors, good attorneys, good CPAs, good wisdom going in. It's not that we're not gonna die because we are. It's that middle space. You know, it's the middle part of the Oreo that gets us into trouble. And if people don't understand that and don't recognize it, there's gonna be really, really bad financial planning. When we talk about life expectancy, right? People believe that we are living longer. You do need to understand that is not true. We are not living that much longer. It's that more of us are living longer. Your probability of living longer has increased. And the probability that you will be one of us or that Don will be one of us or that Joe and Barb will be one of us is that we will fade away as opposed to drop dead. And if our state- I've experienced not- both. I've experienced both. I, I, I can really tell a story in here in my own family about, about those two things. 10% of us drop dead and 90% of us fade away. My father dropped dead at the age of 40 just as he had hit his prime of his goal job. And literally he died of a heart attack with the first paycheck of that in the, in that new uh, leadership role he had still on cash in his pocket, and you know, and literally he had been working for several years to get to this position, and it was this manager of loss prevention for this large department store, um, a, a chain, and uh, and he was uh, this was 1987. He dropped dead, and the the check was still in his pocket, hadn't hit the bank yet. Um, and he was 40 years old and 
there was no financial planning. There wasn't even any appropriate life insurances in place, and it left mom, my mother, um, a widow with f basically four orphans at home, and 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 uh, income dropped by 60, 70 percent. Um, and so that was, you know, that was, and she got through it. I mean, it was, it was a struggle. But now fast forward uh, 30, 33, 34 years, and she's 70, 70, soon to be 71, and uh, she had no financial acumen. And so she has no retirement plan. She is fading away in terms of her financial capability and, and on the fallback position fortunately for her is that I'm taking care of it um, to make sure that, you know, that she has, she doesn't have to sell her house and move into, you know, some basement apartment and, and have a lower quality of life so that she doesn't have to work. Um, and so I've, I've literally felt both of those situations and neither one, and, and neither one of them were, were well planned financially in any way whatsoever. And so, you know, this is, this can, I mean, that, that's an extreme story, but it, it, it is close and personal and real for me. So the and I'm sure many of my listeners have similar stories of some family member who had one or both of those things happen. They drop oh. dead with no plan or they fade away with no plan. And it's left up to the kids or some relative to try to step in and try to figure it out while they're still here. I mean, we're not talking about when my mother moves on, we're talking about letting her have some, you know, maintain a, a good sense of a quality of life while she's still here. So what happens in the United States, and I'm assuming it's probably the same in Canada, is my first trust document was written in 2002. I was a whopping 34, 36 years old, something like that. And it said, here's where we are today, and here's what happens when I die. And it had two clauses, which I'm assuming is the same for the majority of your listeners. Um, if a judge declared me incompetent, or if a doctor declared me incapacitated, that suddenly my successor trustee would take over all of my affairs. It's what I call the nuclear option, Don, right? So, you know, I've got a chief operating officer, I'm sure you do. You know, we're, they're reasonably good sized companies, right? And and yep. there are days when we probably shouldn't be allowed to do everything that we do. You know, I'm responsible at the time of this podcast for $692 million, right? If I'm not paying my bills at home, I probably shouldn't be responsible for $692 million of investments. That doesn't mean that I shouldn't be able to decide that I'm going on a trip with you and Gemma. Right. Right. And what happens in trust documents in the United States is that there it's a nuclear option. One day you have all of the decisions, the next day you have none of the decisions. And as a result, in 34 years of doing what I've done, your lifespan of your father's passing, by the way, two weeks before the crash in 87, in all the years that I've done it, I've yet to see a doctor sign saying that somebody is incapacitated unless they were in a facility or in a coma from an accident in a hospital. And I've yet to see one of my kids take their father or their mother to a judge to say they've lost it. Right. And what I've watched, we hear the stories because that's the way the media works. We hear the stories of the nanny stealing the money or the kid liberating the finances or this, that, and the other thing. And what I'm telling you is I've watched millions of dollars that you and Gemma have worked very, very hard to build up, to save, to accumulate, to establish. And I've watched it liberated, not by any crook or anything else, but by you. Because all of a sudden, the sandwich is getting bit bite by bite, and you don't know that you're not making the same decisions that you were. And so my right. whole career path, I'd love to tell you that I have a total solution for this. Um, this is what I'm going to end my career doing. And, and we're pretty well along it. And when I leave this podcast, I'm going to work on it more. But it's not 
making the trust. It's not what happens when you die. It's what happens in between to make sure that you don't undermine your own decision. That's what incremental incapacitation is all about. Yeah. I mean, you know, in that context, I mean, my, you know, you're a 10 quick start. I'm, I'm, I gotta, I gotta catch up cause I'm a seven, but I'm still a quick start. And I'm also into, you know, ideation. I can start to think about it in the context of my personal life, my wealth management of my personal assets, my businesses, my business operations, every one of them, you know, as I, you know, and, and, you know, and, I try to work on the business. I'm not always in the business. I have built a team to do that. You know, and as our as our, our common friend and coach Dan Sullivan says that, you know, we try to work on the business, not in the business. We're going to be in charge, but we're not necessarily in control. But I think that can be true of our personal checkbook and how we take care of our home, our own personal investments along with our business assets and our business investments and along the way you've got to create the right systems of who can decide to spend a hundred thousand dollars in your business who can decide to invest a hundred thousand dollars or to sell a part of your business because it's the wrong and you know a lot of those decisions tend to be mine when we're going to make an investment, when we're going to make a stop investment, when we're going to sell a part of the business because it's no longer, you know, part of our focus or really creating value. And imagine all of those bits and pieces are all financial decisions that have implications. And I make a lot of those decisions today, uh, but I also delegate a lot of those decisions. But I delegate a lot of those decisions based on an agreement of here's the criteria Here's the criteria of when my operations leader can spend $50,000 inside of a new project without needing to talk to me. But if it's a $100,000 capital asset, then it's my finance team who, you know, there's dual uh, approvals in place. I mean, we have these things in our lives today, but I don't think people think about the flip side of as, we, you know, how do you evaluate at what point where I'm, somehow incapacitate it to be able to make those same sensible decisions. Especially when and, you don't know that you're not able to make them. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, that's the, I think that's the, that's the really important thing is, you know, when we're making bad decisions, we're probably making them from a point of view of we think we're making good decisions, but we don't even have the context of how would I have made this decision 10 years ago? I think we, that that's a got, really important I mean, part uh, of Biting, biting away the sandwich because the sandwich has 27 bites in it and you might not see that there are 16 of them that are gone because you still think you're working with a full deck. <laughs> so my, my worst example, and, and you know, I, I, don't, I don't live in a world of fear, so I don't try to scare people. That's not, so please don't, as you're hearing this, please don't take it that way. But I, and I and I'm not either. I, I just think it's insightful to think about it this way, because I think it's a smarter way to break it it down in terms of how you how you how you make decisions and and, and had, when you decide someone a, else has to. I had a professor. So think about you, Don, because it was you're you're almost his age, and so I had somebody come to see me, and at the end of the conversation, he said, "Listen, I think you." And, and I don't, I don't mean this arrogant in any way, but he said, I think I'm, you may be the best I've ever seen at doing what you do, but because of his profession at Purdue, his position at Purdue, he felt like he needed to be responsible for making investment decisions. And, you know, I, and I've had a lot of people over the last 34 years tell me stuff like that, but in this right. case, he actually emailed me a copy of a letter that he wrote to his wife. And essentially said, you know, if something happens where I cannot make decisions, didn't say death. If I can't make decisions appropriately, call Joe, here's the address, here's the phone number, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So fast forward 10 years later, it's 2012. And that's really when I started my track on, on fading away and incremental incapacitation. Um, 
phone rings and it's the wife screaming at me. And I've been married for 34 years. I know when I'm being hollered at, right? <laughs> um, and she would holler. So he wrote the letter, he copied me, but he put it with the will. She didn't know he was fading away. He didn't know he was fading away, but the $5.6 million of net worth, which is a lot of money in central Indiana that they had built up was gone. It didn't just fade away. It was gone because he made decisions that he would have never made before. But there was no mechanism in place like you and I have from business decisions where we say, okay, if Joe wants to invest a million dollars, I still have a partner group that has to agree that that's a good idea. I may have the biggest vote, but they still get a vote, right? There was no mechanism in place. And a family that could have had a legacy now has nothing because people faded away, not because they didn't have an estate plan not because they weren't educated, not because they didn't save and accumulate, because they didn't understand the process of fading away. And that's what I would challenge you with. If you take anything away from this today, it's understanding incremental incapacitation and figuring out a way where you're willing to look at your mom, your dad, or yourself and say, listen, you can no longer make this decision. You can still make all these other ones. You just can't make this one. No different than Don and I have financial controls in our companies. We need to have those in our estate planning decisions that we make as we go forward. And I think the other key thing that, you know, in that story that, you know, what I heard there, Joe, is it's no good placing that letter attached to your will where no one knows about it. Like you've got you've got to write that instruction while you're still got you know you know a hundred percent of your of your sharpest marbles going and saying you know to your family whether that is to your children or to your wife if I start doing some things that don't seem right like here's what here here's the protocol of you know, of peeling away some of my thinking and by the way you don't need to worry about it and I think this is the, where I want to lead to next is I've got a guy and you know he's my trusted fiduciary that he understands what the plan is here because I'm no longer able to articulate it if I've started to um, not you know not to start making behaviors and decisions that are not consistent with you know how you've known me for our whole lives. You and I talk about Dan Sullivan and strategic coach and, and one of our, one of my favorite things are strategic byproducts, right? Where, where you're working on one problem and you find another solution that's even a bigger deal, right? Well, well, in, well my, my, my entire amplifier business yeah, is the a United strategic States. byproduct, is a strategic byproduct of my innovator business. In the United States, um, in 1980, we had the Keo Act, which really created the separation between defined benefit, which is a pension plan, to a defined contribution plan, where the employer had a known, known cost and they could put money into the plans. Right In 1980, the amount of money that you could put in was minimal. Nobody ever thought that people would have $2 million in 401ks or IRAs or 403Bs. And yet I manage a bunch of them, right? And so when we, when we talk about this decision-making ability and the fading away, I think what is missed is that you couldn't screw up a pension. The 3,000 or the $4,000 a month came in because people like my team were over here managing the money and you didn't have the opportunity to day trade. You didn't have the opportunity to say that this stock or that stock was a good idea or a bad idea. And suddenly you've got people that are 75 and 80 years old, younger, older, doesn't matter. But suddenly you have people with, you know, especially if there's a husband and wife that both worked for the last 41 years, that are now retiring with 2 million or more in assets 
where they can make market moving decisions. And when that happens, ten, market moving decisions, decisions. Ten, 10 times a day, you know, yeah. today we can make all those decisions on this little device here right. and go, you know, we call them sell a hundred thousand dollars of this, buy $50,000 of Bitcoin or whatever. Professional worlds, right. We call them I mean, it's, you know, in, in a lot, in a lot of ways. And in a lot of ways, what I think about, you know, the dangerous, the convenience also has the shadow behavior, right? And the shadow behavior is the way that people can think about trading and investments today because they can do it on their phone. It's just like a video game. You can, you can, you can, you can make, you can play, you can play fake online poker or you can play real online poker. One of them has a big consequence and one of them is entertainment. But, you know, the ability to play around with your $2 million nest egg when you're not quite, the, you know, making the right decisions is dangerously close to your thumbs. And, and what people have to recognize is you won't know when you're not making the right decisions. Yeah. You, you won't know when the mental capacity is deteriorated. And, you know, my kids love me. I'm fortunate. You know, we, our family is not estranged. You know, we get to have Thanksgiving together, but they're not going to, they may take away my car keys. They may say, dad, you shouldn't be driving anymore, but <laughs> they're not going to challenge my portfolio. They're not going to challenge, you know, the company that I built. Right. And if I don't put in something that says incrementally, when I can't do this, take this. It's a small sliver. You're not, you're not offending me. You're not hurting me. I agreed upon it. Here's the process for how we got there. I agreed to it when I was still competent. Take this away. No, you do not have to take me to a doctor. You do not have to take me to a judge. Take this piece away. And when I can't do this, take this piece away. And when I only want to walk a fellow in my lab, right, and have coffee, then take the rest of it away. But I still ought to be able to decide how much I'm going to give to my church. Still decide when I'm going to go on vacation. Still want to decide when I'm going to go see Don and Jim. Yeah. <clears throat> Are you, uh, have you ever watched the television show Billions, which is oh, a yeah. hedge fund show? Yeah. So um, we just discovered this show, and I actually think it was someone else on who came on the show who had mentioned it to me, or someone who was in one of our one of our groups uh, had mentioned the show. I'd never heard of it, and I was literally watching a show, uh, an episode last week, where one of the day traders came into Bobby Axelrod's office and said, "I found the magic pill," and the magic pill was this was this cognitive enhancing pill that, that was supposed to just, you know, connect all the dots and, and heighten your ability to make decisions. And so he, you know, he demonstrates how, how switched on he is to his boss. And then he gives the boss the pill and then Bobby Axelrod takes the pill. And all of a sudden there's a little bit of a psychedelic focus where Bobby, it, it looks like Bobby has figured out how he, you know, he's figured out the formula for all trading. And he comes up with this plan to move into minerals and gold and to corner the market on mining in Chile and a bunch of different things. And he told his team to sell everything and get ready to invest. He, he literally sold $3 billion worth of assets and was about to invest it when someone who, who, who recognized that he was, you know, incapacitated in his decision making, walked in and said, stop. You are about to lose everything. And, and he caught himself and, 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 she, and, and his advisor had stopped him from literally with the stroke of a few decisions, throwing away $3 billion. And I think that's a great example of what you're talking about, except it happened in 45 minutes. It didn't happen over five years or over 45 days or whatever the time period is where you slowly for whatever reasons, uh, are making the wrong decisions. But I think that, 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 that episode reminds me of what we're talking about on, an, on a rapid accelerating scale because I watched it transpire over about a 40-minute episode of this television show and I went, wow, imagine if that happened in your life. And that's exactly what we're talking about except we're stretching it out over two years or five years. And if, if you don't have people who are close to you who can see 
like your friend who uh, whose wife called and they had lost everything, she didn't even know until he was gone. Right. And and so here's the one thing going to Bobby going to Bobby's case that you just brought up in the 45 minute video in the show and it, and it is it, it's you know it's not it's not a show for kids. But it is no, a, not at all. It is an interesting show. I will, uh, I will give you that. The um, you know, every now and then I'll have somebody say, "But, but Dad has good days. Dad has good yeah. days." And what I have to remind them is that Dad can trade on bad days too. Yeah, right? well, as you say, when, when as you say looking, based on what James Clare said. You can you, know, you you can succeed ten different ways, but you can only it might only take one to fail, and that one bad day could wipe you out. And, and that and, and that is critical for your listeners. It's critical for you, you know, to take away when when you're making this decision, when you're looking at the estate plan that you want to have, the legacy plan that you want to leave behind. You've got to protect yourself from your worst day not provide for your best days. You've got to count on that team that's around you to make sure that you've got the provisions that you need for your best days. But you need somebody who's there to be able to protect you from the worst day. How does an entrepreneur know, you know, what, what level of wealth or what level of complexity in their lives that they need a fiduciary? Someone like you to help guide them and start to develop this plan. Where, 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 sh where should they be to start to make this plan, and how early? And is is there a too early point? There's not. We do. Um, so you you need to listen as as you listen to this show. You're going to be one of three people if you're taking the time to listen to this podcast. You're affluent, which means you make a lot of money. You're wealthy, which means you have a lot of money, or you happen to be one of the lucky ones of us that have both. You're making a lot and you already have a lot. And we have a program at the Financial Enhancement Group where we family bundle. So, you know, we take care of Don and Gemma and, and their kids are maybe affluent, uh, but they're not wealthy yet, right? Um, we agree to bundle them and to take care of them along with you and Gemma so that they don't wind up buying insurance products or annuities or things like that that they never should have bought in the first place. Um, people who sell things tend to work with the affluent. People who are money managers tend to work with the wealthy, right? Uh, and so one of, the, one of the most confusing parts about being a fiduciary is I'm obligated as a fiduciary to make financial decisions for you and Gemma that I would make for myself if we were in the same or similar situation. So I've got to think about your age, your income, your assets, your situation. Um, that excludes tax planning, state planning, and everything else. It's all about the investment side. We don't have yet a, in the United States or any place that I know, a true financial fiduciary where you have to look at those five elements that I laid out early on. Uh, that is, mm -hmm. and I won't tell you that we're the only ones that do it. It's our trademark process, but you've got to have somebody who takes care of all of those areas. And honestly, Don, I don't think there's, I don't think it's age dependent. Um, it, it's, you know, what, what I would do with somebody that had $10,000 is different than what I would do with you, but I would still do it in what I believe was my best interest if I were their age and I only had 10 grand. You mentioned five areas and I, you know, and I, I, I can think of obviously tax planning, insurance planning, investment planning. Uh, what else, what, what are the other pieces? All right, so, so the, so our process is called the family focus process. And first of all, it starts with your stated vision. A couple sentences right. that says, here's where you and Gemma want to go. So that everybody on my team, and I think, and I don't know in Canada, what drives me nuts when I go to the doctor or the hospital is seven people ask me the same freaking question where I've got to give them any drugs that I'm on, you know, have I peed, you know, and yeah. it just drives me insane. It's like, can you all take a note, right? 
So every meeting that we have, we've got three people in the room. The notes are all there so that if I get hit by a bus, the next person gets to take over and already knows your story, right? But it starts with your financial vision. The first one is what we call your life after work. And I know this is true of, of entrepreneurs for certain, um, but it's true of most of the world. Most of us don't retire. We don't sit around and watch grass grow. We find something else to do, right? Whether that's at our philanthropic endeavors or, or wherever it is that we're volunteering. I've got a six-figure guy in Indiana that works at Lowe's on Saturday morning because he always wanted to be around tools, right? So it's your life after work. Are we set up for that? When do you make your social security decisions? You know, blah, blah, blah. The second is the annual tax plan. It's calendar year. It's got to be done every year. The third one is the investment playbook. How do you know when investments need to be changed, when they need to be added to, what the contributions of amounts ought to be? The fourth one, you call it life insurance, but it's it's more than just life insurance. It's 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 the good, the bad, and ugly of life. It's the it's the decisions you have to make in a heartbeat that you weren't ready to make before the heartbeat. Right. It's the, you know, somebody, something just happened to one of your kids or something will happen to one of your parents or you, you hit the lottery. Right. It's the good and bad and ugly of life. And then the last one is the legacy plan. And I don't care how long you and I work, you know, we're, we're doing it for our charities. We're doing it for our kids. We're doing it for our spouses. If we don't have our legacy plans in order, Don, it doesn't matter how much money we make. Right. We lost it all because we didn't do the legacy plan. Or if the IRS in the United States takes 50% of it because we didn't think it through, it didn't matter, right? It's, so the idea is making sure that all of those areas are checked off, that they all work, and, and that you do it in a, in a proper planning process. You know, we talked earlier, you mentioned, you know, we have to have these plans, whether you're in Scotland or Ireland or Canada or the United States or you know, anywhere in, 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 in the Western world anyway, uh, you know, where we have similar, similar economies and we may have different rules and different rules and, 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 uh, and laws, but structures are all kind of similar. Um, you know, in our situation, you know, we live in Canada. We have businesses in Canada. We make money in Canada and the United States, um, and we own assets in the United in the United Kingdom. Um, and my wife has, you know, legacy retirement plans from some of her career in the U in the UK. And uh, you know, e each one of those pieces has some complexity to it because there's different inheritance taxes, there's capital gains that are different for different properties, and and it can be complex. Um, but you know, but it, you don't need to figure it out on your own. You need to find the right people. You know, you know what our what our friends uh, Ben Hardy uh, and uh, Dan Sullivan wrote the book on. It's it's who, not how. Amen. But you could, but you better find the right who who knows all of those five hows, and ideally, uh, not five different people who aren't talking to each other. The so. Okay, so on, on that one, I um, you, you need five experts, Don. Yeah, yeah. You still only want one chef in the kitchen. Yep, I agree. Right, so I was on a meeting last night with, with um, there, there were six people on the screen. None of them made less than a million dollars a year U.S. And, you know, one of them said, I don't understand why this CPA is saying one thing and this CPA is saying another thing. And, and I looked at him and I said, here's the deal. If you went out and had 10 CPAs do your return, you're going to get 10 different answers. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and that doesn't mean that any of them are wrong or that you would be audited. I'm just telling you, you're going to get 10 different answers when you have a complex tax return or a complex business profile that you've got to deal with. And, and what, I would, what I would encourage people to do is, is you neither either, either need to be the best browser or the best server. And that was a Harry Dent comment from 2001 or two. Um, you either need to know the most about taxes or the most about estate planning or the most about retirement, or you need to be the person who can assimilate 
all of those professionals and put them together so that they're coordinated. I don't think my superpower, or my unique power is necessarily knowing the most of any of those areas. I think what I built was a team that has multiple people that know the best of those areas where I can coordinate one dish in a kitchen to make sure that we're serving the apple pie that we need to have um, where, where we want it to look. Get it. I totally get it. Um, what else do people need to know, Joe? Hmm. Um, that life is good. Uh, that we need to enjoy it. Don't live out of fear. Um, live out of opportunity. Take what you can get out of this crazy COVID world we live in and figure out how you're going to maximize it while other people are sitting around biting their fingernails and figuring out how to lose from it. Um, relax, breathe. Um, you know, we, we live in a, we live in an incredible world. And, and, you know, those of you that have the opportunity to listen to this podcast have, have extreme opportunities that most people will never have, right? We, we get to go to work. We get to be with our families. We get to go to the grocery store. Um, and those are things that not everybody gets to do, right? So let's, let's, work at, look, let's look at this world as one of opportunity, not one of obligation, and figure out how we're going to add as opposed to simply subtract and, uh, and just enjoy each other. You know, in the United States, we're getting ready for Thanksgiving. Um, it's my favorite holiday. And, um, you know, I, I always, I've got a lot of German friends and Irish friends, and I always tell them happy Thanksgiving and they giggle at me. Um, but I would tell you as my Canadian friends, I got a lot of them, um, have a happy Thanksgiving. Just enjoy and be grateful. Uh, if there's anything that I can do to help, you can always find us at my, my podcast is consider this program doc, and wherever you go to listen to that, you can go to consider this program.com. Our website's your life after work. That's what we think it's all about. Your life after work.com. Don, I've really enjoyed being on the show with you, buddy. And uh, I'm very, very grateful uh, for the relationship and the time that we've been able to spend together. I, I always love catching up and I can't wait until we're back at a couple of our groups live. Um, so we can hang out you know, in the evenings and uh, sit by the pool and, you know, our, let our wives chat. Uh, they, they uh, the last time we did that, uh, the, the, both of our wives, I think spent, well, we were in meetings for two days or three days back in Phoenix, a couple of years before, you know, just before COVID. Um, they, they had a wonderful time, uh, hanging out, out by the pool and your wife was laughing at my daughter who was just excited about getting, getting room service sent to the, uh, sent to the pool while, while, uh, while dad got to sit in a boardroom and, and, and talk and learn. So, um, I'm looking forward to doing that again and I'm hoping we're going to be able to do that in February. On your website, you've also got some free resources where people can, you know, take a little bit, you know, you've got a, uh, do I need a fiduciary quiz? on your website. So that's a free resource uh, for listeners. If you go to uh, Joe's website, yourlifeafterwork.com, there is a do I need a fiduciary quiz on there. He's also got a free ebook on there, which is uh, uh, how to retire on $500,000. And Joe, you've got a new book coming out, what, next year, you said? It should be out sometime around March or April called Retirement Runway. Um, you know, I think people... I think people understand how to save money and that doesn't mean they know how to invest it, but they do, they do know how to save it. And uh, Wall Street makes all of their money by helping you preserve it. Um, the problem is at some point in time, you have to land the plane. And in the United States, we force you to take the money out so that it can be taxed. Um, but either, either you're gonna take it out so you have a better life the IRS is going to force you to take it out so they have more income or your heirs are going to spend it. And what the whole point of the book is trying to help people understand the end in mind as opposed to the beginning. Um, you know, we call it defined contribution plans in the United States. And I, I own defineddistribution.com for a reason. 
Um, I think that's the way people need to start. When you put your first dollar in a retirement plan, or as my Australian friends would say, your retirement scheme, which always cracks me up, um, you need to start with the end in mind. All right, I'm putting it in. When am I going to get it out? How's it going to look? And you know, so the, the book will be available, like I said, the you know, sometime around March or April of 2022. Um, and Don, I appreciate the kind words. Here's here's the deal. I'm a I'm a checklist nut. And if you haven't read the checklist manifesto, you probably oughta if you're a reader. Um, but if you've got something that happens in your life that is emotional, and I don't care where you live, um, I, don't, I don't care what country, what state. Um, if you've got something that happens emotional in your life, you're still going to have to probably make financial decisions, but you really don't want to make them while you're in the middle of trauma. Um, and, you know, I've done this for four decades for a lot of people. And so we've built a lot more checklists that are simp that are on our website, you know, so if if you've got to figure out whether or not to go through a divorce or to lease a car or how to pay for college or any of that stuff, you know, just send us an email. Um, you know, yourlifeafterwork.com, put it out there. Somebody on my team will help you. We believe that not everybody is right for the financial enhancement group. Um, it's just, it is what it is. We're fiduciaries, we manage money. Um, but that doesn't mean that people don't have a right to good common sense financial planning. And, you know, if, if I know something and I don't share it with you, when you have a question, I feel like I'm doing something wrong. So don't feel like you're being a burden. If you've got a question, a situation, and you need help, just go to yourlifeafterwork.com. We will do our best to, uh, to give you our guidance and wisdom. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. There you have it, folks. Big Joe Clark, he spent, you know, if you want to learn uh, and be educated about all of this, Joe has 20 years of podcasts, videos, radio shows, you know, go to his website and, you know, start listen, looking and listening. You know, he is, he is a sage when it comes to all of this. And he's also my friend. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Don. Be well.